It's Hungary's birthday. Prime Minister Viktor Orban throws a party. The guests included the heads of Turkey, Serbia, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Qatar. It looks like an informal summit of like-minded illiberal leaders. For a member of both the European Union and NATO, it was an unusual invitation list. It didn't include France's President Emmanuel Macron or Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz. In fact, not one serving EU leader came to the party or to the subsequent diplomatic meetings. And the only NATO member was Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. So what is going on in Hungary and why does Orban have the friends that he does? And he has more to talk about with uh, authoritarian leaders such as Aliyev, the uh, Azerbaijani president, than with, um, for example, the German chancellor. So he feels more and more this uh, shared ideology. But on the other hand, he also thinks that pragmatically this is the right thing to do. This is laid out in Orban's Eastern opening strategy. It's a blend of pragmatism, seeing powers like Turkey, Russia and China as useful and reliable partners, for example, buying energy, and shared ideological disdain for European liberal democracy. Az átonyra futott liberális demokrácia helyett inkább felépítettük a 21. századi keresztény demokráciát, amely garantálja az ember méltóságát, szabadságát és biztonságát. Hungary remains a member of two major Western alliances, the EU and NATO, but has often departed from the majority view of its partners. Within NATO, Hungary joined Turkey in refusing to ratify Sweden's accession. Turkey portrayed its position as a principled one connected to Koran burnings in Sweden. Hungary had a couple of other unspoken reasons. Viktor Orban used uh, the Swedish and Finnish NATO membership as a negotiation potential in order to pressurize the European Union to provide the funds to Hungary. And this is definitely something new. So this attitude that in one organization we use pressure for another organization, that is very unusual in the Western political culture. And I think this is very telling about how Viktor Orban is exercising power in Hungary for many years. It's no, not new to us. The new logic of foreign policy is a rogue diplomacy. If you don't treat me well, I will hurt you immediately. And this is what we can see these days with uh, the non-ratification of uh, Sweden's NATO accession. The Hungarian government openly says that because Sweden criticized Hungary so many times, they are still reluctant. And within the EU, following Vladimir Putin's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Hungary refused to join efforts to reduce imports of Russian gas. Instead, Hungary signed new deals and now gets around 80% of its gas from Russia. That makes Hungary an extreme outlier in terms of its unitary dependence on Russian imports of gas, oil and uh, nuclear fuel for the nuclear power plant. They look at Russia as a sort of trusted partner. Um, also, I think with these uh, countries it's much easier to have a less accountable, less transparent uh, relationships. So if you're trading with more established democracies, uh, it's more likely that what you are doing is going to be out in the open. It's very difficult to hide uh, things. And what kind of things might Hungary want to keep out of sight? Transparency International latest ranking puts it at the bottom in the EU for perceived corruption. This has long been a point of friction between Hungary and the EU. Orban's approach to migration has also been out of tune with his Western partners. He has spent a decade issuing anti-immigration rhetoric and claiming to defend Christianity. 2015 saw huge numbers of people passing through Hungary towards Western Europe. Hungary responded with a razor wire fence to keep them out. 
More recently, Hungary seemed to copy Belarus with a tactic seemingly aimed at putting pressure on Western neighbors. I think open blackmailing, uh, open, uh, open uh, obstruction is more and more part of the Hungarian foreign policy playbook. To an extent where Hungary arrived to a point uh, a few months ago that the Hungarian authorities released more than 1,000 human smugglers from Hungarian prisons telling that if you, Brussels, are complaining about the uh, Hungarian prisons are overcrowded, this is what you get. What is it? It's the open weaponization of uh, of migration, something that Lukashenko is usually doing. And within the European Union, it is taken as a highly hostile act. It, uh... This kind of attitude, one that puts Hungary first and rejects the sensibilities of allies, appeals to more than Orban's voter base at home. He has become something of a hero to a certain group of American conservatives. Texas 2022, CPAC one of the oldest lobby groups for the U.S. right wing. Viktor Orban is invited to speak. He flatters his audience and makes a bid to deepen the friendship. I come from a thousand-year-old country with rich history. But let's be honest, Hungary is far from being a global superpower. The U.S. is a global superpower. Your leaders should give an opening speech at our conferences in Hungary. They did. Hungary has hosted CPAC in Budapest twice since 2022, nurturing the links and exchange of ideas. Orban's government is investing in homegrown conservative think tanks too. Rod Dreher is a fellow of one of them, the Danube Institute in Hungary. He describes himself as conservative, orthodox Christian and approves of political involvement in academia. The key thing about Orban, though, for American conservatives is he seemed to understand that culture is a realm of political battle. This is something that Republicans and standard conservative thinkers in the U.S. don't understand. It's like they see the universities, they see the media and all of that to the left. Orban doesn't do that, and I think that he understood something that we American conservatives really should learn if we are going to prevail. Rod Dreher was on the guest list of that Hungarian birthday party. His thinking fits with Orban's. They and many other conservatives subscribe to a specific counter-narrative. I think the counter-narrative should be nations have a right to be sovereign, to look out for their own interests. We should cooperate among nations, but it is not the right of Washington or Brussels to force our own national ideology on other nations. For example, uh, Viktor Orban always says, leave us Hungarians alone on family policy. We don't want Sweden to be Hungary. We don't want Belgium to be Hungary. But let us do things according to our own traditions. Many like-minded thinkers met up here at Hungary's demographic conference. They rejected non-traditional forms of family, along with many other progressive social ideas. The star of the event this year, Giorgia Meloni, Italy's prime minister. Put the family at the heart of development policies, and these are clearly influenced by national cultures, identities, customs, and traditions. However, there are many experiences that have worked, that are important to share, as the experience that we see here in Hungary. The speakers include Jordan Peterson, a well-known figure on the alt-right, who talks about people who don't have children being mentally unwell. Orban takes the personal and turns it political, Europe-wide, in his speech. Kurzus váltásra van szükség. El kell érni, hogy családbarát, konzervatív erő kerüljenek kormányra minél több európai országban. Ráadásul jövőre európai parlamenti választások is lesznek. Minden adott, hogy egy átkaruló hadművelettel a magunk javára fordítsuk az erőviszonyokat. Orbán's critics say 
he focuses on such divisive personal issues to divert attention from other policies and questions. Orban wants always to talk about ideology. He, he wants us to talk about his gender policies. He wants us to talk about his immigration policy. He does not really want us to talk about his corruption issues and to talk about his rogue foreign policy that can undermine uh, from inside the security of the European Union. <laughs> Angry demonstrations on Hungarian streets show that domestically there are problems Orbán's policies are not fixing, in particular soaring inflation and an education system in dire need of reform. Students and their teachers have been marching for nearly a year against a law which they say will strip teachers of protections granted to public employees. They see it as a way for the government to control public education. It's really important, important for us to be here because without uh, people who are able to choose their own future and uh, decide for themselves, which is obviously learned in school, uh, we cannot build a democracy upon that. Hungarians are also frustrated by everyday corruption and years of Orbán's government effectively eroding the independence of judges and courts. Orbán seems to care little for Hungary's actual alliances in the EU and NATO, and he's been failing to cure Hungary of its domestic problems. And yet, he is in his fourth elected term in office since 2010. So how does he and how does the Fidesz party keep winning over Hungarian voters? Fidesz is a very uh, mixed but uh, seemingly unified uh, ideology. And this ideology is based on the concept of the strong and big state, uh, which uh, has the responsibility and the power to rule the country, basically without other actors such as civil society or citizen participation. And th this is a, this strong state idea is a very strong base for, for this government, which is different from, from the European norm. It's an ideology that resonates in Hungary. Some also say Orbán knows very well how his people tick. He can turn what others might describe as repression and ultra-conservatism into a heroic story. Orbán clearly reads well uh, the Hungarian psyche and Hungarian mentality, and he, he uh, resurrects the archetype of the freedom fighter from the Hungarian uh, uh, collective uh, psyche. And, and the most important aspect of this freedom fighter uh, narrative is that you have to fight against the oppressors, and even if you fail, you're morally superior. That kind of narrative means Orban can portray his meeting with Putin in October 2023, with the war in Ukraine still raging as an act of pragmatic national interest. Orban's approach to foreign policy is clearly out of step with the majority of Hungary's partners in the EU and NATO. His approach is seen by many as counterproductive to their collective aims. He built these strategies with the belief that the West is declining and the geopolitical shifts will put Europe into a minority position. So he also wants to build leverage on putting Hungary to the center and opening to the east. No surprise then that Western governments are asking how they might bring him back into line. It's the EU which has had the greatest tool to use in trying to influence Hungary, financial transfers. It's been holding back billions of euros over concern for Hungarian rule of law and fundamental civil rights. But securing Hungary's backing for continued extensive aid for Ukraine is the greater goal. It's a tug of war between the EU and its member Hungary, involving massive sums of money over domestic and foreign policy. He may be happy to be the black sheep, 
but some suggest Orban wants to remain in the herd, that he's more wedded to the EU and NATO than his attitude might suggest. Viktor Orban takes huge risk at least two levels. One is that with this uh, confrontative position, uh, we are risking uh, trust with our current allies with the, within the European Union and the NATO. And it's very important to know that Hungary does never want to leave the EU or the NATO. So these are critical relationships. Uh, no relationship with Turkey, Uzbekistan or whoever could replace the relationship for us within the European Union. Orban continues to pursue these other friendships, signaling to the West that he has other options. And yet, his Western partners like Germany's Chancellor still want democratic groupings to demonstrate strength through unity to actors like Russia and China. So they'll be keen to rein him in or find a way to work around his attitude. He will become more obstructive, he will become uh, more combatant, uh, he will become more dangerous to the European Union and NATO if there are no good ways to circumvent his decisions. And I think what would be rather good, and it's on, on the table of the European Union constantly, is get rid of the anonymous decision-making in foreign policy issues and, and have rather a qualified majority. But people with insider understanding of FIDES suggest those Western powers are playing a more complicated game, that they may even privately welcome what they publicly disdain. He's often playing the uh, useful idiot for many other countries, for Germany, for Austria. He speaks openly about Ukraine should never be a NATO member when he says this that it means that a lot of other countries also think this, they just don't say. So I think this is also a leverage building activity from his side, that he sometimes makes favors for other politicians uh, by being so radical and outspoken. What Orban does is to expose the divisions and weaknesses of the European Union and NATO. Many would argue the EU has long needed to reform. There are 27 members, swollen after the 2004 expansion, when 10 countries joined in one go. And NATO too is facing new challenges, including the cold hard truth that the United States can no longer do everything for Europe. So perhaps this could be Orban's contribution to the evolution of these partnerships if the European Union and NATO react to Hungary's obstruction by making themselves fit for the future that may include new members such as Ukraine.